to show up. Well, welcome everybody to the June uh, New Jersey Coastal Brazilian Collaborative Technical Assistance Coffee Chat. I am Samantha Chrysler, the Communication Specialist at New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium, and I'm helping the NJCRC to launch this coffee chat program through facilitation and meeting planning. For those of you who are here for the first time, NJCRC is a network of coastal resilience professionals and the purpose of this coffee chat program is to better facilitate connections between local communities and stakeholders who have technical assistance needs with NJCRC members who can assist with these needs. So I just wanna make sure that everyone is aware we are recording today's session. And we have two uh, special speakers today presenting at this coffee chat. So first we have Chris Abrupta, who is the Extension Specialist in Water Resources with Rutgers, Rutgers Cooperative Extension. And he is a professor with the Department of Environmental Scientists at the School of Environmental and Biological Sciences at Rutgers University. He has a doctorate in civil engineering from Stevens Institute of Technology and an MS in civil engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology and a BS in civil engineering from New Jersey Institute of Technology. And we also have Richard Kelly, He's an engineer for the Rutgers Cooperative Extension Water Resources Program, and he is the New Jersey Sea Grant Consortium Water Resources Agent. He graduated Rutgers University with a Bachelor in Science in Bioenvironmental Engineering and is currently enrolled in the Bioenvironmental Bio Engineering Master's Program at Rutgers. That was a mouthful, and you know, as impressive as these guys' resumes are, these presentations are going to be just as incredible. So with Without further ado, I'm going to hand it off to Chris um, to start off. Okay, can you guys see that? Yep. Awesome. Yep. I love when things like this work. Let me uh, get out of these floating meeting controls. Uh, so I guess what I'm going to do is I, I'm going to kind of give the presentation and, and Rich will chime in when he feels necessary and then we'll answer questions at the end. Uh, you know, we probably have about 20 minutes uh, to go through this. Um, some of it may be a review for a lot of you, but um, it's basically going to talk a little bit about green infrastructure. Um, a lot of people call it green stormwater infrastructure, uh, especially when we're talking about coastal areas, because we don't want to really confuse it with some of the other things that we consider green infrastructure, like living shorelines and things like that. So what we're really talking about is stormwater management here. OK, so. Um, we always start these presentations showing people this natural water cycle uh, or the, the hydrologic cycle as, as we as engineers have to call it with big words so we could charge more money for things like this. Um, so um, we have this natural water cycle. The kids in New Jersey learn this in fourth grade um, and they, they learn how the, the snow from our mountaintops, um, you know, melts and goes down into the prairie and, and fills our streams and, and it's just, you know, a, a perfect cycle the water can't be created or destroyed it just goes through this natural cycle and and when the kids see this this picture they realize this is not jersey at all uh we're nowhere close to this right so um so we begin talking about you know how we've changed our natural water cycle and, and what we've added and it's always about development uh in new jersey i tell people a lot i was in a conference in uh, vermont uh about a month or so ago and I said that uh, New Jersey is going to be the first state in the, in the nation to reach build out. And they said, when do you think that's going to occur? And I, I told them probably next Tuesday. Um, <laughs> and, and they thought I was joking, but we're pretty close to it, you know. So um, under natural conditions, uh, about 10 percent of the stormwater runs off uh, as we start adding single family homes, um, you know, one, two acre lot residential. We get about 20 percent runoff. We have smaller lots, quarter acre, half acre lots, about 30 percent runoff. And then we get downtown urban areas where we're talking Camden or Trenton or, you know, even Long Branch. You know, you start getting about 55 percent runoff because we've added all these pervious surfaces. So an impervious surface is any surface that water doesn't pass through. Um, so, you know, it's the roof of the building, the driveway, the parking lot, the sidewalk. Um, a lot of people would consider some of the lawns in Ocean County at the retirement communities that are really compacted. They compact the heck out of the ground. They threw sod on top and water really doesn't get through the through the sod and in, into the soil, that, that might actually be considered an impervious service too, because water does not infiltrate in a lot of those cases. So um, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to, we've actually added these impervious services. So we've really changed uh, this water cycle, right? So now we've got this, what we call an urban water cycle. Um, and we can see 
Um, we've reduced the amount of infiltration because we've covered the surface with these impervious surfaces. So there's no less infiltration. There's much more runoff. Runoff gets there much quicker because it's traveling over um, pavement and rooftops and, and hard surfaces as opposed to vegetated surfaces. Um, in a lot of ca cases, there's less uh, transpiration. Uh, transpiration is a term that we use when we talk about how plants and trees pump water back into the atmosphere. Like when we, uh, we exercise and well, when some people exercise, I don't really, I'm not too into that. But if you were into exercising, you'd sweat and you would perspire. Well, the same thing happens with plants. I mean, they, they release water through their leaves and it's called transpiration. So when we have less plants and less leaves and less grass, we have less transpiration. So that's another problem that we have uh, kind of with this water cycle. So, um, so then we go to what we have here is dealing with the stormwater management. So in a lot of cases, we're gonna try to figure out how to make the urban water cycle look more like a natural water cycle. So really focusing on stormwater, Stormwater when it rains or snow melts, it's the water that moves across the surface, picks up pollution, carries it to our rivers or lakes or bays or estuaries. Um, and, you know, this is what we're trying to deal with in New Jersey. Um, New Jersey's waterways, about 95% of our waterways are not meeting water quality standards. And the primary reason is because of stormwater runoff. Okay. So we have things like this, the top picture, you can see the harmful algal blooms that we have in New Jersey, that green slime on the water. Uh, too much nutrients in the water causes this, so too much nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, we have a lot of erosion in the lower right-hand corner, another problem with stormwater causing that erosion, but also as that land erodes, the sediment gets into that lake or that water body, and that's more uh, detriment to our water quality. And then you can see the, the great job that we do in cleaning our catch basins in that center picture in the bottom there, you know, um, I think that's, was that a Popeye's cup there? I don't know, maybe, I don't know. But anyway, so um, you can see that, uh, you know, this is why we do street sweeping to try to prevent that from happening, right? And then we have the other issue with stormwater is flooding. And it doesn't take a lot for this to happen in New Jersey. We get about an inch and inch, half of rain, we start getting roads closed. Uh, and we call it nuisance flooding, uh, kind of inconveniences our everyday lives. Um, it happens maybe uh, 10, 15 times a year in New Jersey. You know, um, when we get larger rains like the nor'easters or hurricanes, we get a lot more severe flooding. But this is another issue that we deal with, with stormwater management. So, you know, we can see flooding in urban areas. Uh, and then we see the very severe flooding that we have here. And this is a picture of uh, Manville, New Jersey during uh, Ida uh, last storm. Um, and uh, it's kind of a, uh, really could be a problem. And, and a lot of issues too, a lot of these homes that are flooding um, are in areas that are, are the poorer communities, right? Because they live next to the river. Uh, it's only homes they can afford. Um, so it's also an equity issue uh, that we have to deal with is that, you know, how do we protect these people's homes? And if we try to get them out of those areas, move to other areas, where can they afford to go? This becomes another, another problem we start thinking about. Um, so anyway, so deal with this issue we're dealing with, we're going to use green infrastructure uh, as a solution, uh, basically a cost effective way to manage stormwater. Uh, the idea is instead of putting that big detention basin at the bottom of the hill and letting all the stormwater run through the 50 acre subdivision and carry all the pollution to that detention basin at the bottom of the hill, we're going to scatter smaller systems throughout the entire development and capture the rainwater where it lands. So at the end of the downspout, the end of the driveway, right off the roadways, before it becomes stormwater runoff and picks up the pollution and carries it away, we're going to try to capture that water, filter that water, and then absorb it or get it back into the ground. And we got lots of different ways of doing that. We think about green infrastructure practices. There's really five functions that they do, and not all practices do all these functions, but um, some only do one, some will do all, but uh, some of the practices infiltrate, some of the practice filter, uh, others just provide storage for water to be re reused. Some promote evaporation, holding the water, letting it go back to the atmosphere, and some uh, promote transpiration. So um, these are the green infrastructure practices that we uh, we can we have and we talk about in New Jersey. Um, bioretention is the most common practice. Um, rain gardens are the most common bioretention system that we have, and and it's a uh, really uh, we'll talk about each one of these a little bit. Um, permeable pavements, another practice that we, we really like in New Jersey, is a great way to store water. And actually the permeable pavement can be used to store even more water 
than what we would normally store from a water quality storm, but from the bigger storms, we can actually use permeable pavements to store some of those larger larger rainfall events, uh, you know, like the rainfall from nor'easters and, and hurricanes. And then we have rainwater harvesting, dry wells, rooftop systems. So these are some of the things that we think about when we think about green infrastructure. Um, to talk about bioretention first, and these are the ones that we talk about. Um, I think the rain garden is the most common one. Um, it's basically a shallow landscape depression, uh, usually um, about six inches deep. So it rains, it'll fill with about six inches of water. That water will sit there. And over the next 24 hours, it'll slowly percolate into the ground. Uh, the plants will take up the nutrients. There's a mulch layer in there that actually help uh, decompose some of the other pollutants that are in there. There's a, a lot of microbial activity in there. As the water is moving through the soil, uh, pollution is, is absorbing to the soil particles and getting trapped in there. Um, and then the water becomes cleaner. Uh, what we like about this is we use native plants, so it's pollinator habitat. It can be very beautiful, can add to the landscaping. Um, so it's a really nice way to manage stormwater. New Jersey DEP recommends we design these for the water quality storm, which is an inch and a quarter rain over two hours. Here at Rutgers, we've been designing these to manage a two-year storm, which is 3.3 inches of rain over 24 hours. So we can absorb a lot of water. It's not going to get your 100-year storm, which is about eight inches of rain over 24 hours, but it can chip off a little bit of that, you know. So we have lots of different types of rain gardens here. Um, we do a lot of this stuff at schools. You see up in the right-hand corner, we have a is Homedale School. Uh, we had an interior courtyard that was renovated and we put four rain gardens in the courtyard and got rid of the asphalt. Uh, and each rain garden represented a different season. We have a winter rain garden, a summer rain garden, a fall and a spring rain garden. So um, during those seasons, those, those rain gardens have special plants that will attract, would be very attractive during those seasons. So, uh, so that we, and we get the kids to help us plant, which is great. I mean, they learn a lot about the environment. Um, we also think about it as free labor, uh, and it's great because kids are small, so they're closer to the ground. It's easier for them to plant, you know, so it's really good. And usually you just have to feed them pizza and they'll work for a while until they eat. And then they're pretty useless afterwards. But, um, the center pictures of rain garden we built in uh, Camden, at old, an old abandoned gas station. So that's a, that was a really nice one too. It's another, another rain. And this is a picture of one of the components of that rain garden in Camden. I like showing this picture because we can see that we have a trench drain in the top of the slide there across the sidewalk and gets the water from the roadway through the sidewalk into the garden. So there is a way to get water from the road into a rain garden, even if you have a sidewalk blocking it. You know, so this is, this is the way we do this quite often. Um, here's another one that we had built. Uh, I like this one because we excavated it out and we kept the soil on site. So we gave that area a little contour relief right? So we didn't have to haul the soil away. So it made the project a lot cheaper, but yet it does a great job of storing water. This is Chris Perez, one of our landscape architects. I like this garden. This is a school. What happened is uh, we dug around the existing drain. So we dug six inches down and built the garden. Now when it rains, it fills up with six inches of water. That water will sit there and slowly percolate into the ground. If it rains harder, we get seven or eight inches of water. The water will overflow into that inlet and it'll take that water away to where it was going before. So we're using the existing infrastructure to provide the overflow for the garden. A uh, really nice system. And the kids in these classrooms don't have to look out an ugly lawn all day. They can see the butterflies and, and the plants and it becomes really nice. And we can use this as an educational tool at the school too. Um, there's a rain garden in a house. You wouldn't even know this was a rain garden unless you walked up and realized there was a depression there, just taking water from the rooftop downspout. Um, one of the other systems we use a lot of is permeable pavement. Uh, so there's different types of permeable pavement. So I, I tell a story. I'm, I'm starting to believe that it actually might be true. Um, the first uh, pavement in, in, in the world was, was this very coarse material, coarse asphalt, and, and water passed right through the coarse asphalt. Um, so what we did is we compacted the ground. We put this coarse asphalt on top. Water would go through the coarse asphalt, couldn't go into the ground. So it sat just below the surface. It froze, expanded, contracted, and the pothole was created. So we as engineers, we know how to solve problems. We say, you know what we're going to do? We're going to add a fine material to the asphalt. So water won't be able to pass through it. There won't be any more potholes. And, and that's the asphalt that we use today. And it works really well, right? There's no potholes anymore in New Jersey, right? Okay, so that didn't work, right? So about 30 years ago, somebody said, well, wait a minute, let's think about it differently. Instead of changing the material we're using, why don't we 
give the water a place to go. Let's go back to the coarse material, but instead of having to go into that hard surface, let's put a stone layer underneath the stone reservoir where the water can go into this clean stone, sit in there and have a chance to slowly percolate into the ground. And that's what permeable pavement became. So, um, and this is a really great system. Uh, you can see it here. Uh, the porous asphalt is in the parking spaces and the cartways where the cars drive in is regular asphalt. So the regular asphalt can flow onto the porous and that stone layer can be as, as thick as you need it to be to store as much water as you want. Um, there's lots of different types of materials. Uh, we mostly use porous asphalt, but there is also pervious concrete, which just looks a little bit like popcorn-y, like, like one of those rice cakes. If you're ever on a diet and had to eat those, it's kind of what it looks like. Um, there's also these grass pavers. Uh, you may have seen these, um, and I got some pictures of those. So this is a kind of a cross section of it. I really like this picture on the right because it kind of shows that, you know, that layer there can be as thick as you need the void space is about 40 percent so every two and a half gallons of stone you can store about a gallon of water so depending on how much water you want to store you can put stone underneath that's a parking lot up in vermont at a lowe's and a target that's eight feet of stone underneath it and it stores a ton of water under there and it, it holds it there and it lets it out slowly over time um so you can really use this as a great way of of holding water what's nice about it is it breathes because it's porous um, so it doesn't heat up as much, so it helps with the heat island effect. Uh, as water is passing through the stone material, it's getting filtered, so it cleans the water. Um, the other thing that happens is there's no black ice on this. When you plow snow on a parking lot, and you would plow snow on this like a regular parking lot, you plow it up into the corner of the parking lot, it melts during the day, the water trickles down over the parking lot, then it flash freezes at night, and you have that black ice. And you know, your mother-in-law comes over, she slips on the ice, she breaks a hip, she moves in with you for life. Now you've ruined your quality of life altogether. So in an effort not to do that, by using porous asphalt, the water goes right through the asphalt into the stone so you get no black ice. So it's a really great way to kind of limit that. I, I imagine in the future we're going to see this being required at a lot of senior communities, uh, and there are going to be insurance breaks because they're using this because... You know, broken hip, it's a lot easier to put in porous asphalt than to repair a broken hip. So, um, you know, so this is really, really a great, great tool. Here's a project we did in Clark. You can see the cartways, regular asphalt. The parking spaces are porous. You can see it's just rained here. Um, what's nice about the porous is it always looks new because it doesn't stain. So it's really pretty cool. Here's pervious concrete sidewalk we did in Camden. Um, Permeable pavers, well, this is for the rich people in Long Branch. They do this stuff. Um, you know, it's it's very expensive. It's very good. Uh, water goes through the through the slots and the pavers. But like I said, it's it's really expensive. It's hard to do this in a lot of places. But, you know, if you're building a, a beautiful home, it's, it's a nice addition for your driveway. Instead of going with the regular asphalt driveway to have the permeable pavers, and it really helps the environment. Once again, this has got that stone layer underneath 6, 12. 18 inches of stone, depending on how much water you want to store. And these are the grass pavers I'm talking about. This was done at a public works building in Parsippany. Uh, this is a fire access road behind the building. Uh, when it rains, the water goes through those grass openings in those concrete blocks. There's six inches of stone underneath, uh, and water goes in there and will percolate into the ground. Uh, you could drive a fire truck on this. It's a great surface, so uh, really nice to use. Um, we use a lot of these on overflow areas like uh, church parking lots. Like I'm a devout Catholic, so I go to church twice a year, Christmas and Easter. Uh, and I always got to park in that back parking lot that no one ever uses the other 50 weeks of the year. So this would be great for a parking lot like that. That's not getting a lot of use, you know. Uh, it's also great for soccer fields and parking lots of soccer fields and baseball fields. So it's a really nice surface for that kind of thing. The other thing we do a lot of is rainwater harvesting. Right now, New Jersey is considered a water rich state, but as climate continues to change, we're going to get more intense storm events followed by longer periods of drought. So we may get a heavy rainfall on a Monday and then may not rain for two weeks. Right. So what are we going to do? Well, is there a way to harvest that water and use that water in the future? So most common way to harvest water is a rain barrel. Rain barrel doesn't do much for stormwater management. Uh, we often refer to it as the gateway drug to stormwater management because once people put a rain barrel in, they want a rain garden or a green roof or a poor asphalt driveway. It gets them excited about it. They feel like they're doing something. Um, it really doesn't do much for stormwater management other than really increase the environmental stewardship, which may be even better than actually managing stormwater because having more people be aware of this and concerned about it is going to really, really be where we need to kind of go. Um, we do use bigger cisterns. The one in the lower right-hand corner was put at the Clark's Public Works building. Clark does not have a uh, car wash 
in their town. Uh, so they have a lot of nonprofit car washes at the high school, which is right, right next to this public works building. So now they harvest rainwater from the rooftop. It fills this tank up. People pull up on a concrete uh, pad across the parking lot where they run a hose from this with a pump. They power wash the cars. Uh, they give them a little flyer about how they're using rainwater to wash your cars and water conservation things people can do at home. And all the soapy water goes down a concrete channel into a rain garden. And that rain garden removes about 95% of the surfactants. We did a study to, to, to look at the soapiness and if we can remove it with a rain garden. It does a very good job. So this is a great, a great system that, that we have. Um, and we use a lot of these at community gardens. This is one that was built in Newark. Um, in Newark, they have a lot of vacant lots that they convert to community gardens. And, you know, a lot of times they don't have water. Right. Because uh, if the water company put a spigot at the community lot, I mean, God, they'd be losing so much money, what, like maybe 20, 30 dollars a year in water bills they'd be losing. So why would the water company do that? So they're unwilling to do that. So we harvest rainwater from the neighbor's house. Uh, it looks kind of looks like Rutgers knocking on the door and saying, hey, we're from the university. We want to harvest rainwater from your rooftop and for the community garden next door. And they asked, well, what does that look like? It's. It looks like Rutgers putting all new gutters on your house. And they said, well, that's great. When can you do that? You know, and then what happens is if that vacant lot sold, we go, we drain that cistern and we throw it in the back of a pickup truck. We take it to the next lot, you know, so we don't lose a lot. I mean, we lose a concrete pad, but it's not a big deal. So we can use this over and over and over again. You know, here's one that was done in Patterson. Here's a slimline one. This is about 21 inches uh, wide. It looks a little bit like a Lego. Um, and it fits right next to the wall, so it doesn't take up a lot of room on the sidewalks. So if you have a narrow space, you can use this. Um, so my last point is about flooding, and a lot of people are concerned about flooding. So you can use by retention uh, these rain gardens to, to manage these larger storms. This is one at the Freeland Heisen Arboretum, a by retention system, basically a large rain garden. Uh, this will handle a 100-year storm. Uh, the first six inches uh, of water will go in here from the water quality storm, that inch and a quarter of rain. So the first six inches will sit in here and slowly percolate into the ground. But then afterwards, the rest of the 100-year storm will, will fill up in here and be slowly released over time. Um, it's a great system, but it's big. It takes up a lot of area, right? So there's another one at a, at a, uh, at a, a commercial building in, in Branchburg. I think this is a Reddington. Um, and another system, beautiful system, but lots of land. So what we're trying to think about here with green infrastructure is how do we go in to existing development and retrofit it with stormwater management? That's what green infrastructure is best used for, right? Because a lot of New Jersey was built before 1980, 1990, when we had no stormwater regulations. And there's a lot of development out there that has no stormwater management at all. So can we go back in and retrofit it? Well, we can with rain gardens and things like that in a lot of cases. And and treat some of the stormwater runoff, capture the first inch or two, or maybe three inches of rainfall that runs off the land. But can we capture that hundred year storm in some of these cases? And well, if you have land like this, you could, or you could do something a little different. Like here's a rain garden that we had, um, that was built up in North Jersey. And this takes about an inch and a quarter of rain from that parking lot. You know, so when you get an inch and a quarter of rain, it runs off, goes into this rain garden. Now we could design this to take eight inches of rain. <laughs> it would be about six times deeper about three and a half feet deep. It would look like a big basin, basically. Uh, we could do that here, right? But it's only going to be able to take the runoff from that parking lot, nothing else. So we started thinking about this a little bit. So, well, could we still use these rain guards, but then tie it to underground systems? So under each parking lot, could we put these storage systems where we can actually store water? And if we did this, not only could I manage the, I could use a one acre parking lot to manage the 100 year storm, stored underneath the parking lot, use rain guards to treat the first inch of rain. Um, but I could design this. So not only could I manage that one acre parking lot that this is under, but I could also manage two or three or four acres of the surrounding area if I can get it under that parking lot. So I can use that one parking lot to manage three or four acres of land. So this becomes a way as we move forward in the future and as we start replacing parking lots, maybe thinking about retrofitting them into being stormwater systems, uh, we, whether we're using this stone layer underneath this big thick stone or putting the piping in to have even more storage. Um, this is something that we had considered. Um, so my, my thought here for municipalities is that if you guys really want to do something about stormwater management, you're really concerned about the hundred year storm. Well, 
this is a great place to store the water under parking lots. And maybe this is where we need to start moving forward. Every time we redo a parking lot, we make it into a stormwater system, right? For individuals, homeowners, residents, I think everybody has to think about doing their part. Everybody should have a rain garden at their house. These are really easy to build. They're gardens. They're, it's, it's nice to get outside and, and take care of it and exercise and get out of, I know Netflix and, and Amazon Prime is very appealing and Hulu and Paramount and all the other streaming channels that you guys have. But hey, you know what? Maybe get your ass off the couch and go outside and build a garden. You know, so this is something that we're trying to promote too. So um, Rutgers, um, we're Rutgers Cooperative Extension, Rich and I, and, and Rich is one of my engineers. And uh, we run programs throughout the entire state where we help people and towns uh, design gardens, um, design green infrastructure. Um, I have a set of plans on my desk right now with a rain garden on it. Yesterday, I was looking at a poor asphalt parking lot. Um, so we design these things. We help people get grant funding to build these things. Um, and we try to encourage uh, towns to work along with us. This picture here is Hillsborough Township. Uh, that rain garden there was put in front of the Missile Building. Uh, the township who had no interest at all in getting a rain garden in front of the Missile Building. They, they didn't want it. They weren't excited about it. They got other things they had to worry about. But we told them we had grant money to do it, and grant money was running out. And they said, well, we can't give back grant money. Let's build a garden. So um, the Public Works guys and the Parks Departments helped us build this in the town. And they had no idea what they're doing. The guy in the back goes digging it out. He's like, he doesn't know what he's doing. He finally realizes, oh, I'm putting a hole in the ground, put plants in it, water's going to go in there. Next thing you know, they're, they're changing the design. They're, they're giving it a smoother edge so they can get around it with the mower easier and things like that. So they plant it. We help us plant it. Uh, I go out there a week later, and they have a sprinkler system installed to make sure it gets watered. Guys took total ownership of it. About a year later, I get a phone call from the head of public works, and he says, uh, Chris, I got a problem here on this Partridge Farm Road flooding issue. I'm thinking about building a rain garden here. Maybe you can help us out. And I said, wait a minute, Rich. Uh, two years ago, you didn't even know what the hell a rain garden was. He said, yeah, but they were easy to build, a lot cheaper than concrete pipes and inlets, and my guys had fun doing it. He said, I, I think it might be a cheap solution for this, this flooding issue. So so now not only did they learn how to build it, they've added this kind of tool to their to their toolbox. Uh, and I think that's what we're trying to accomplish here is get people thinking about how to manage water in better ways because nobody has any money. So concrete piping and concrete inlets and are very expensive. So these things can be a lot more reasonable and they look beautiful. Now this garden they didn't want is on the picture. You know, every time I get a calendar from Hillsborough Township, it's got this garden on the front page, you know. Uh, at Christmas, they have Santa Claus at the end of this path, and the rain garden has Christmas lights in it. You got to go through the path to get to Santa Claus. And, you know, it's, it's become a focal point of the town now. It's been really pretty interesting uh, for something they weren't very interested in, in the first place. So um, that's it. I guess we have questions, right? No questions. That's it. Uh -huh. um, there are a couple of questions that popped up in the chat as you were talking. Uh, I just put them together so I could get answer them pretty quickly. Uh, Regina asked, um, "Do we have a way to track the effectiveness of these projects um, when we build them? Like Chris mentioned, we size them for specific storms. So when we build them, we size them for the two-year storm event. We combine them that with a uh, lot." type data so if it's like a high medium low residential rural urban agricultural anything like that um, the njdp actually has uh, loading rates for each of those specific lot types so using that and the amount of water that goes into our systems we can kind of estimate how much pollution we take off and is treated by each system um, yeah, i mean we, we found it's really expensive to monitor these things um, so we use a lot of literature data that's been generated at university of new hampshire stormwater center uh, Washington State has a stormwater center. Uh, we've got colleagues, uh, Bill Hunt down at, at uh, North Carolina State, uh, Michael Dietz up at UConn, all have been collecting data on these systems. Um, and provided we, we build it a certain way, we're pretty confident we're getting a certain removal rate. Um, one of the issues, though, that we have, especially in a coastal area, is that um, nitrogen is a big pollutant, right? Nitrogen, Barnegat Bay, we're really worried about nitrogen. So these systems, um, are designed to capture water and pass it into the groundwater table. In a lot of cases, you have nitrogen kind of flowing through the system, uh, and you're only getting about 30% nitrogen removal. Now, you can change the system. There's a design that we've used, and we did one at Georgian Court, 
where we lined the system and we had a internal water storage area. So basically the water goes in, sits in this lined area and it allows it a day or so to denitrify. Okay, so it's an anaerobic zone and, and it, the nitrogen turns into gas and it's decreased. And then it rains again, it pushes that water out through, a, through an underdrain pipe. So it's a great way to do that. And, and it's very similar to the gravel wetland systems that New Jersey DEP had, we tried to build uh, throughout the Barnegat Bay watershed. So it's another another example that we're trying to do. And we all, we're always trying to get funding to do research. It's been hard to kind of do that though. So what else, Rich? Uh, and then the second part of Regina's question was, um, are we able to share the cost of construction, operation, and maintenance for these projects? Um, we do have a maintenance mail, which is available to the public. I'll make sure to send it over to Laura and Tom, so that way it can be sent out to everyone after this meeting. Um, and then for costing, usually we estimate about $5 a square foot for rain guard installation, but it can vary depending on, you know, if you're using a, a contractor to dig it out with an excavation or you're doing it yourself or you're working with a DEP or some other public entity. So it does have a little bit of, of leeway for that kind of pricing. But, yeah, I mean, or, we, we've paid as much as $25 a square foot for a contractor to build it. Um, and we paid as little as 50 cents a square foot when we build it ourselves with like volunteers and the public works guys. So it is a huge range. Maintenance is not, is not very expensive. Um, sometimes you're replacing the mulch every year. Uh, it's just labor, you know, and if you do it twice a year, um, it's a lot easier than letting it go and trying to do it once every four years is what we're finding. So, uh, so it's really, really important. And no matter whether you maintain it or not, typically it's going to work. If it's filled with weeds, it's still going to work as a rain guard. It's still going to infiltrate water and ground. It's not going to look great, but it's still going to work. Um, so the maintenance really that's required is, well, yeah, we have to make sure the sediment doesn't block the water from getting into the garden. But the maintenance is more geared at making it look attractive uh, to the property owner. So what else, Rich? Uh, and then the next question was, uh, Isabel asked as a follow-up, uh, what uh, is the maintenance frequency and the cost for permeable pavement projects? Um, for permeable pavement, we can uh, we recommend for porous concrete and porous asphalt, which are two types of permeable projects, uh, those should be cleaned semi-annually by high pressure vacuum systems if possible. Whereas the uh, porous pavers, they can be cleaned annually instead. Um, I wasn't, I don't know if you have a cost for that off the top of your head, Chris. Yeah, so typically what happens with the porous asphalt, the, the asphalt itself costs the same as regular asphalt. You know, it's, it's two to four dollars a square foot. Um, but if you're going into an existing parking lot, and you're taking out the current asphalt, then you have to take out that asphalt, you have to haul it away, you have to dig out the soil and put in six or 12 inches of stone, that's where the cost gets added. So it can be as much as 10 to $20 a square foot, uh, depending on the stone layer that you're putting in, how far you have to haul the soil away. Um, so that becomes another, another factor in it. Um, and that's why we're trying to, the parking lot we did in Clark was a new parking lot they were building. And they had money set aside to do it using regular regular asphalt and we we're able to get a grant to pay the difference because instead of doing regular asphalt they used the porous but instead of only having you know four or six inches of stone underneath they had two feet of stone underneath so that added to the cost so we paid that through a grant but in the end they wound up saving money because they didn't have to put in all the inlets because water goes right through the parking lot they didn't need the inlets anymore so they saved money on the inlets so it wound up cost them less because we we're able to get the grant uh, than what they're originally going to pay so so that turned out to be a really really nice example so what else, Rich? Uh, and then the last question coming from the chat was from Mariana um, asking if uh, any of funding for these types of projects could come from FEMA mitigation programs. We're working on that now. <laughs> we're trying. We're trying to get. We're trying to get FEMA interested in this. So, actually, I'm working with Somerset County uh, Emergency Management Office, trying to get them excited about. They've included a lot of our green infrastructure plans into their all hazard mitigation plans. So now we're trying to figure out how do we get some funding to work with them to implement some projects uh, based on that. Um, we haven't tapped too much into FEMA money. We get a lot of um, NIFWF money, National Fish and Wildlife Foundation money. Um, there's a lot of that floating around. If you're in the um, if you're in the Delaware River watershed, there's uh, William Penn money too. We've been using some of that. So like the lower Delaware area has been been good for that. New Jersey DP has 319H grant funding, which is a pass through from EPA and we've been trying to tap into that. There's been a lot of that money going around lately. Um, 
along with the corporate business tax money. Um, and we, and if you build a rain garden, you can cure COVID. So we're trying to get COVID money out of this too, as a, as a means to, as, as another, another way of getting funding, you know? So any, anything else, any other questions? But, uh, that was it for chat questions. I don't know if anyone just wanted to unmute and ask. Yeah, I'll just ask a couple of quick questions. So are you dealing with a lot of groundwater issues when you're trying to do <clears throat> some of these, you know, more low tech solutions? Um, you know, obviously you got to have that assumption that water is going to flow downward. Yeah, so so groundwater is an issue uh, whenever we're putting in any bioretention system, any system infiltrates, we need at least two feet below the bottom of the system to the groundwater table to seasonal high groundwater table. So we're always doing test pits, trying to make sure we understand what that seasonal high water table is. If the water table is too high, we cannot use bioretention. We cannot use these infiltration systems. We can use systems as storage systems. We, we put these in and we've lined these. We actually did one out in the uh, uh, Lopacon. Uh, they were worried about um, uh, more of sinkholes because of limestone. So we lined the system and the water goes in, it stores the water and it slowly goes out through a, a, they had a perforated pipe underneath that carries the water out to catch basin and goes on to the stream. So you can use these as storage systems and not infiltration systems, storage and treatment systems. So you can do that. The other thing we've been talking about and we're trying to get going now is that we got a lot of homeowners who come to us and they say, you know, I'm, I'm right next to the lake, the water table's high, or I'm right next to the bay, the water table's high, and I, I don't think I can put it in a rain garden. There's other options. So, so we've been helping people design vegetative buffers, but we're also talking about designing pocket wetlands for people. So they can have a, a nice little wetland in their backyard and wetlands can have pollinator plants in it just like anything else and can be very beautiful. And those wetland plants will absorb a lot of that water and help filter out a lot of that pollution. So we're starting to think about, okay, you can get a rain garden, you can get a pocket wetland, or maybe you can get a vegetated buffer as to kind of three options that we'll design for you. We do a, a rain garden a rebate program where we've been able to do this in different places where we're able to get some funding. Uh, we do a one hour talk on what a rain garden is, why you might want one. And then at the end of that talk, you can sign up for a half hour block and you'll sit down with one of our engineers and one of our landscape architects and they'll work with you to specifically design a rain garden or two or three for your property. Uh, and at the end of that design session, you actually get a design that you can go and actually build. Uh, if you build a design, we were giving people rebates of uh, $3 a square foot. So um, the most rebate a homeowner could get was $450. So they build a 150 square foot rain garden. They would get a, a Visa gift card from us for $450. Now that Visa gift card, you can only use at the Rutgers bookstore, but no, no, I'm just teasing. No, so, so that was trying to offset the cost. And that's worked out really nicely because uh, we get a lot of people excited about it. And that's enough money to pay for the plants and the mulch if they're digging it out themselves. It's not enough money to hire a contractor and do it. So that's kind of where that falls apart a little bit, you know? So, um, but that's a great program. And we've adapted that to not only design rain gardens, but design uh, repairing buffers, uh, especially around Lake Apacon and some of these lakes that are suffering from harmful algal blooms. So we've been doing that for people too. Uh, and people just really, it, they really just need a little bit of help trying to figure out what plants to use and where to put it. And in a lot of cases, uh, about nine times out of 10, people say, here's where I want to put the rain garden, here's what I want to do. And, and they just want our validation. Like, yeah, that's a perfect spot to do it, you know? Or no, you're crazy, that's wrong, let's put it over here. But, you know, they, they just need like a pat on the back to get going, you know, and, and that's, that's really what we're trying to do in a lot of cases like that. So that's one program we run. The other program we run, we run a, a green infrastructure champions program. Because what we found is that the way green infrastructure gets installed at local communities is usually is a local champion. You know, someone who advocates for it at the local level, because we're trying to put in stormwater management where it's not required. You know, there's existing development. There's a lot of drainage problems, a lot of stormwater problems. So let's go put some green infrastructure in. Um, so you need someone at the local level advocating for that. So we we didn't have a lot of advocates for it. So we said, well, let's create some. So we run a course. Uh, it's, it's 10 classes. It starts the middle of uh, January. It's every other Friday from 10 to noon. It's all virtual. Um, if you miss one, it's taped. You can you can catch it later. Um, and we talk all about green infrastructure, how to identify projects, how to design rain gardens green infrastructure and climate change, um, green infrastructure for schools. Uh, we talk about stormwater regulations, how green infrastructure fits into that. Um, so really trying to give people a, a, a nice breadth of education on, on green infrastructure so they can go advocate for it at the local level. You take five, five of the 10 classes, we give you a certificate, and then we actually 
will uh, help you along the way. So once you're a certified champion with a certificate, um, people call us up and we'll design rain gardens for them, for their community and, and help them get grants to build it. Uh, some communities have gotten twenty, thirty thousand dollars grants with our help to do some of this work. So it's been really a lot of fun to do that. Um, and it really directs a lot of people who want to do something. They just don't know what to do. So it really helps focus your attention on, you know, here's one thing you can do that actually is going to create a measurable change uh, and something that you could see, you're going to see something for, you know, like um, I, I know I, I stopped using plastic bags and I stopped using plastic straws, but I, I don't, I don't know if I see a change in, in the planet from that. But when I build a rain garden, I can see water, storm water going in and no water coming out. Like, okay, I, I'm making a difference. So, so it's a really nice thing to kind of get people to do. So I'd like to say that Chris has really made a difference in my life and the life, the life of Monmouth County residents. As a Rutgers extension agent in Monmouth County, uh, I had built a rain garden in my house in 1995 and I screwed it all up. I didn't know how to take soil percolation, calculate the amount of water from my uh, rooftop. Everything died. When Chris came to Rutgers, he showed me what to do. We wrote a fact sheet about it. I built a rain garden in my county office. It was spectacular. Tens of thousands of people saw it. We built, with Chris's help, a rain garden in 50 municipalities in Monmouth County. It expanded to over a thousand private ones in Monmouth County. And his, I'm amazed to see this uh, program going on and on. Presentation is fabulous and funny as, as typical. Chris, I'd just like you to know that our next big project besides the Bradley Beach Maritime Forest is now a living shoreline in Shark River and Alec Majeski is on this call. I'd like you to speak with him. So because we also have water coming down from the hills in Shark River, which has yeah. never worked with the duck hills that we installed. And then a living shoreline and a breakwater reef are being planned. After two years, we're finally getting our million dollars from <laughs> FEMA that was delayed. So you would be the expert that I hope you can talk more with Alex in the future. Yeah, you know, so it's interesting you say that, Bill. I mean, a lot of this stuff is trying to combine things together, like uh, living shorelines with st stormwater management, you know, and, and then there's also the social component to this. You know, you know, how do we get people excited about doing the taking this and doing it at home? Um, you know, the fact sheet that Bill and I put together years ago, we still use that all the time. Uh, we have a, a green infrastructure guidance manual that, that we have out. We also have a rain garden manual. Uh, and then we worked with University of Connecticut and they have a rain garden app that they put together. And, and so we have loaded up all New Jersey information on that. So you can go to the app store and download the rain garden app. It says Yukon on it. But when you open up, you click on New Jersey. It's all Jersey specific wow. information on there. It's, it's available in Apple and Android format. Um, a really great tool to use. We had a middle school kids in Bridgewater use the app to design a rain garden and they did such a great job. We had to go out and help them build it, you know, so it was a lot of, a lot of fun, you know, um, and now they're, they're trying to write their own apps to add on to what we've, what we've done. So it's, it's been, it's been a great experience, you know, and um, I think, I think it keeps growing and growing. And, and I, you know, I, um, you know, when I first got here and started working with Bill in Monmouth County, I, I didn't realize people were already excited about this, you know, and, and it was so easy to get people. It, it's just such an easy thing to do. And it can look so beautiful at a house, you know, or, or at a, at a municipal building. We should have one of these at every library, every municipal building, every school, you know, I mean, that's kind of what we're trying to, trying to figure out how to do. So. Yeah. Great work. What Thanks. else? Anything else? Or can I go eat pizza? Hey, uh, Chris, I have a quick question. You had mentioned the challenges of getting funding for this type of work, and uh, I'm not sure if you've been following the, the infrastructure bill or other bills. That, um, do, do you see any funding coming down for communities to do these kind of projects? Well, you know, it's funny because I saw the governor with the Reggie funding, the uh, regional greenhouse gas initiative money, and I had a lot of people calling me about going after that. And one of the bullets in there was that you needed to have full blown designs already. And a lot of people don't have that. You know, um, we've been doing these green infrastructure feasibility studies for towns and the designs we have in there are pretty close to being shovel ready. Not that far off, but they're not they're not quite there. Uh, the other thing I noticed in that was they're really promoting urban forestry and things like that, which, you know, they they didn't consider the fact that 
there's other green infrastructure that can sequester carbon. Uh, we know the rain gardens do a great job of sequestering carbon much better than a lawn, uh, you know, 10 times as much as a lawn. So, so we're trying to figure out how do we start getting people thinking about that a little bit more about getting that carbon credit for these systems, not just the water quality credit. Um, the other funding that we, we see a lot of, well, we, we apply for a lot of the lake funding that came out. Uh, a lot of communities want to do this as, as a lake project. So uh, I must have helped five or six communities put together the proposals to do stuff around their lakes. Um, the 319H program this year, New Jersey DEP had, I guess, something like, uh, I don't know, nine or $10 million. Um, we helped put together about 12 grant proposals for community. One thing that we do is that people call us up a lot and say, hey, we want to go after this money. And if I think it's a really good project, I'll help them put the proposal together. Uh, and then we'll write ourselves in if they want us to work. And sometimes they don't. Like Candid put together a proposal to do a, a green street project uh, that we had done a concept design for. But their consulting engineer was going to do the full blown design. So I just helped them put the proposal together. And, and then, you know, we didn't we weren't even part of it. We just made sure they got it together and got it in, you know, to try to get some of the funding. So we're doing a lot of that, trying to help people get the money. There's sustainable Jersey money is out there. So if you're a sustainable Jersey community, they give out grants. And Jack gives out a little bit of money. I wish it was a little bit more because it's like fifteen hundred dollars. Really? It was twenty five hundred dollars. It would be so much better. <laughs> you know, it's try to talk to Jen Coffee about maybe she could increase that and be better off. But. But, you know, that's a little bit of money to get going. Um, and a lot of times you don't need a lot of money to do a project. Like if you want to build one of these at a library, all I need is a DPW guy, you know, who's going to be there to dig it out and has a place to move the soil to and some volunteers and just a little bit of money to pay my guys to do design. Uh, so my salary, you know, like Bill's salary, we're paid for by the university, you know, or the county, you know, so we're covered. Uh, unfortunately, Rich is on grant funding. So everything he does, I have to find funding for him. And I've got seven full-time staff, you know, all on grant funding. So, um, you know, there's no free lunch. You know, I, I called a plumber the other day. He didn't come over and just fix my pipes. I had to pay him, you know. So, so the same thing when we design rain gardens, the same kind of, kind of thing. So um, there are some times that people have called us. Like, for example, Mammoth Beach called us up one day and said, hey, we want a rain garden. I said, hey, it's great. We got some money uh, left over from our Sea Grant project. And we wound up doing design for them for nothing, you know, and helped them put it in, had money for construction oversight, you know, so that happens quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, uh, I think Fairhaven called us up. They wanted a green infrastructure plan one time and we were looking for one more town to do a plan for. I'm like, yeah, sure. We actually have money to do that. So I guess it goes to show you, it doesn't hurt to ask, you know, and, and sometimes we have money, sometimes we don't. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping the, this uh, infrastructure bill that, they passed in Washington is going to have some of this money in it, but I haven't really seen that. You know, um, I know the uh, Barnegat Bay estuary program and then the, um, I guess the Hudson river estuary program, they're getting about $900,000 a year for each of the next five years. So I'm hoping some of that money goes to these projects, you know, um, but I'm not too sure how they're going to spend that. Um, but that's kind of hardwired into that infrastructure act. So there's, there's funding there. And I guess, reach out to, I don't know, who's that, uh, Stan Hale, is that, who, who right, runs right, it? Stan. Yeah, call, I'll give you, I'll give you his home number. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but I think no, you're right, that, you yeah. know, just, there's, there's money earmarked for specific programs, but I, I do think NOAA will be announcing how they're going to utilize their additional funding through the infrastructure bill in the coming weeks, yeah. so that might be something to keep an eye out for. Uh, so I guess, I guess one thing for this group, Tom, is we just put in uh, a grant for uh, a proposal to Sea Grant because uh, we have these green infrastructure champions and we have about almost 300 of them now certified. And we were asking for funding to uh, work with those champions to build maybe 10 or 12 projects. Um, we're looking at underserved communities, what New Jersey is calling overburdened communities. Fortunately, about 310 of our 565 municipalities are considered overburden communities so um you know so if you have a section of town that you know english is the second language that kind of considered overburden community or there's a little little below the poverty line you know so there's opportunities there so we're trying to get that going we're also trying to train more champions our goal is to try to get some kind of dedicated funding that we can use to give sub awards to every cha champions every year very similar way sustainable jersey does they get money they get checks from uh, I guess Walmart 
and they give out money every year to people in the sustainable Jersey program. We'd like to do the same thing with the uh, green infrastructure champions program. As we move forward, we just have to figure out what that source of money is going to be. And um, I'm hoping we'll get this money from Sea Grant and uh, show that proof of concept that it actually works. And then we'll be able to use that to leverage some additional funding in the future from someplace else. So yeah, it's all about money, right? Everything. So it's a shame. Is there anything else? Oh, we got, okay, Regina's yeah. got another question. Yeah, just to, just to follow up on that. Um, so sure. you have your champions trained. Are the resources that you're using to train them with, are they publicly available? If someone's not able to make that full commitment, but maybe they can benefit yeah, from uh, that yeah. So, knowledge? Uh, yeah, so we, we have, um, we have a, a website, Green Research Champion website. You can go on there and you can click on any one of the presentations and download the video of the presentation, the PowerPoint's there. So it's all there. Um, that's being funded in part by the Dodge Foundation. Uh, I'm not sure how much longer they're going to fund that because Dodge is kind of shifting to this whole diversity, equity, inclusion model. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure how, if my program is going to be able to kind of satisfy their requirements for that. Um, we also use some money from the William Penn Foundation that we have for that and some Sea Grant funding that we have for that. So, uh, so it's all kind of tied together. Uh, so that pays for my staff to do the programming. Uh, so for example, we've got a champion comes in and says, you know, I need a rain guard design for my library. Could you help me? And I'll say, okay, yeah, we do have some money allocated. So Rich can design you a rain garden for your library. And there's no charge for that. As long as you guys figure out how to pay for the supplies and to build it, uh, you know, we'll even give you a hand in, in overseeing construction. So that's a lot of what we've been trying to do. Um, but yeah, so all that stuff's online that um, you go to my website, water.ruckers.edu. Um, I'm sure Rich is going to put it in the chat now. And then uh, there's a green infrastructure champion um, a page under projects. And uh, that's, uh, that's kind of where, where everything is. And if you have any problems finding, you just send us an email. We'll certainly help you. No, I found it right away. Great. This is awesome. Yeah, I think I'd just like kinda... to amplify the message and share yeah. it, that kind of thing. So this is all like you're, you're, you're good with anybody accessing. It's not like the, you're only looking to educate people who are coming like through your system, like a certification process. It's... No, no. It's funny because we have, we have a, once you got virtual, it went crazy. I got a green infrastructure champion that's certified in Colorado, one in Puerto Rico, one in Massachusetts, because they're all taken it online. They heard about it. Uh, and I was up in Vermont at the uh, Nui Pit conference, which is their kind of their non-point source conference. And I presented uh, the program and they all want to know when they could sign up for it. So I got a feeling we have a lot of people from the New England area signing up next year. Uh, but yeah, it's online. Zoom, we got, a, I don't know, 500 people. I think my Zoom account can handle. So I think we're good. You know, we had uh, about 120 last year. So. Yeah, no, that's that's great. Just aware, raising awareness and, and capability is is important because this is the type of thing where, yes, it might be a water quality measure more so than a stormwater management, but it couples really well yeah. with with good stormwater management yeah. projects. Well, I mean, you got a lot of good people here. I'm, I'm looking at the at who's participating here. You know, you got Bill Sharapa here and I see uh, my friend Thonay's on. That's good. John Thonay. So there's a lot, there's a lot of good people on, on this call who can, who could help too, you know? So there's, um, and I, I think this whole coffee chat's a great idea trying to put people together, you know, to figure out how to, how to do things and, and maybe uh, leverage off of each other. You know, uh, I think we're stronger together than we are individually. So that, that makes a lot of sense. So and then maybe somebody from DEPs on here and says, you know what, we should fund that program. You know, that would be great too, or EPA, you know, it'd be great. So, or Noah, maybe Noah would be great. So anything else guys? Okay. Well, my coffee never made it, Samantha, or my Cinnabon. I never got it. So I'm going to have to go have some pizza now. So That's not a bad trade-off though. It, I think it's so. Lunch, it I is lunchtime. So, <laughs> so I, I will, uh, I think I already sent you this presentation. If you want to post, that's fine. It, it is a, it is a scripted PowerPoint. So people can use it um, or you can just post it as a uh, as a PDF, however you want to use it. So, OK. And a recording of this coffee chat will be posted on the NJCRC website, which I just posted in the chat. So we will. Uh, I forgot that. about that. I wouldn't have sworn so much. OK, <laughs> I'll see you guys it. later. Thanks. <laughs>